What's up, everyone? Today we're talking about uh, this team from MIT and Harvard that work together. Um, we're able to create fuel from carbon dioxide using this really interesting process. Um, in my mind, it's like turning CO2 from the villain into maybe not the hero, but like a really interesting character in the clean energy saga where we're able to use CO2 as a way to kind of stabilize and, and make a like version of hydrogen fuel that's really stable, really useful with an awesome shelf life. Um, turning this yucky gas in the air that's been poisoning us and, you know, increasing the um, temperature of our earth um, into a clean powder that can sit on a shelf for years and we can use it to generate electricity whenever we need it. Kind of interesting. I, I think it's worth di- jumping into, but... And it's it's worth mentioning, um, making CO2 into something that's not bad has been... It's, it's not like a new idea. People have been after this for some time. Yeah. In fact, um, our last episode, <laughs> we also talked about turning CO2 into something useful. Yeah. And I don't know, I, out of both of the, you know, that's still fresh in my mind, out of the both of the articles that we read, this one has the most potential, in my opinion, and I'm excited to jump into it. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that's interesting about what we talked about last episode is if if anyone didn't listen to it, or if they need a recap, you can go back and listen if you'd like. But <laughs> it talked about using the sun to turn CO2 into syngas, which is like a precursor for things like uh, jet fuel and stuff like that. But what we're talking about here is turning CO2 into formate, which is a non-toxic, it's a stable fuel, and it doesn't need to be combusted. Um, it's this powder that you can essentially mix with water in a fuel cell and generate electricity. So... Um, f- in this case, we've got the ability to turn CO2 into something that stores, in some ways, electricity, um, which is a lot more valuable for us when we're talking about electrifying a lot of the world around us. Um, and it's much more meaningful, in my mind, to have Formate with a fuel cell as something as like a backup generator for your house than it is to have a, a bunch of syngas that you need to process into kerosene and then burn in a generator um to to turn on the lights in your house formate this product that we're talking about from this team from mit and harvard is actually really really useful when you are trying to create something that can be used to store and generate electricity yeah yeah and it's i think it's worth mentioning um before we get into formate what the current form of this um carbon capture to turn into something useful has been like for the most part yeah um it's usually been like this two-stage process of you capture the carbon dioxide gas and you turn it into something that's solid looks like calcium carbonate is is the go-to and then once you have that solidified material you heat it to drive off the carbon dioxide and convert it to a fuel feedstock like carbon monoxide now the reason that this sucks is because the carbon monoxide, that feedstock, is actually what's leading you to get the fuel that you actually want. Mm-hmm. And that heating process is super inefficient, which means that you're roughly converting less than 20% of that carbon dioxide into that feedstock, which gives you the source. And, th- and that's so, what lossy. the big m- measurement they talk about here, the big metric is carbon efficiency. Mm-hmm. So how much carbon is being turned from this precursor material into the final fuel that you end up using um in this case you're saying current state of the art is like 20 percent or less or less um that that's not optimal yeah not 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 by any means um and one of the other drawbacks i want to talk about is every time we try to turn co2 back into fuel um it generally not just as inefficient it also ends up producing a fuel that's relatively hard to handle or it's toxic or it's flammable um even syngas like we talked about in the last episode at least we've got infrastructure set up to be able to handle that type of gas but it definitely fits the bill of something that's toxic and flammable Mm -hmm. um one of the things that we're talking about here though and and this team from mit and harvard's trying trying to achieve is let's make something that's solid let's make something that's stable something that's relatively inert until you need to be able to use it again but it's also still a very viable fuel 
to be used in a reaction to generate energy in the future. And it seems like they've been able to achieve that. And the cool thing about Formate, by the way, is I didn't know this. Um, not not the exact composition that they're talking about here, but a form of it is commonly used as a de-icer. So we're we're already familiar with what it takes to manufacture it to an extent, how to store it safe, safely, and the fact that it's non-toxic has been proven over a long amount of time. So it's not like this is a completely new chemical that we have to go through the trials and processes to figure out, you know, how bad actually is it for our environment. So that's that's kind of reassuring to me. Now. Do you want to start getting into the sauce or? Yeah, so, let's talk about their okay. secret sauce, kind of the process of how they're turning carbon dioxide into formate. I think the the first part of that um, is a bicarbonate cathode. Um, that's the negative electrode used to handle bicarbonate, which is basically just CO2 dissolved in liquid. Um, and then there's an intermediate buffer layer that helps maintain the right chemical environment for the reaction. Then the the secret secret sauce I think is this cation exchange membrane. It's a selective barrier that only lets certain types of positively charged particles through. And then 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 on the other side there's a water anode where positive electrode where water is split to help drive the reaction. Basically what they're able to do is first can you know transform CO2 into liquid metal bicarbonate first, and then at that point they're able to selectively either turn that into potassium or sodium formate using a low carbon electricity source. And I want to dive a little bit more into that low carbon electricity source, but the big important part for everyone to understand here is they're able to turn CO2 into this output material. The only inputs that they need are a little bit of water, a little bit of CO2, and a little bit of electricity, and they're able to get this fuel. They're able to do this process at room temperature, at moderate pressures, so it's pretty safe, pretty energy efficient, um, and unlike many of the parallels we could draw to like hydrogen processing, where everything needs to happen at an extremely low temperature or extremely high pressure, in this case, it seems like at standard room temperature and standard room pressure, we're able to do a lot of this process, which again, it helps. It's a, it lends credit towards the, uh, the fact that we might be able to scale this in the future. Right, right. And, you know, it's it's pretty easy to see now, but they've completely axed that second step of taking your precursor material and having to heat it up, which was super inefficient. Now you have this liquid potassium that, like you mentioned, there's some sort of low carbon energy source that you're going to use to get to your end material. And that's replacing that stage two that was so, so inefficient. Storage, all that good stuff is also a lot more um, viable for mass manufacturing which makes it pretty exciting. Yeah, and and again, the output here, you get a stable, solid fuel that can be stored in a normal steel tank, um, not like trying to store hydrogen where we've talked in the past around a lot of the limitations around extreme temperatures, extreme pressures, and over a long period of time, if you're trying to sco- store liquid hydrogen in a pressurized tank, you actually need to let it off gas, otherwise the tank will explode. Right. So, you you lose hydrogen if you're trying to store it over a long period of time at room temperature. Um, so the, the, a lot of the challenges we experience with hydrogen, um, which can be used in a very similar manner as formate, right? You use it in a fuel cell, um, able to use it as a storage method for electricity. Um, in this case, we're able to use formate in a similar manner, um, has slightly lower energy density than hydrogen, but much more stable, much more convenient, much more scalable because of all these constraints that are gone around temperature and pressure. Yeah, and while we're we, while we haven't completely moved on from the topic of manufacturing, I think it's worth noting within their sauce, um, one of the bits that they've incorporated, which allowed them to be more streamlined than any other competition, is the membrane used to convert. Um, you know, during the process to convert from CO2 to the, the feedstock, the fuel feedstock. They had noticed that in other processes, this would get clogged up with um, byproducts of, of the process and it would change the pH. And by changing the pH of the membrane, you would not get the same quality of... Um, you lose efficiency, basically. You lose efficiency, correct. So they, uh, they, they noticed that that was happening and they implemented a change to make sure that the pH was consistent um, throughout the entire process. 
So that that's, I guess, worth noting because if you're going to scale, you're going to be doing this a lot. You don't want any downtime to you know maintain that solution over and over again. Well, and I think it it's that's a great segue to talk about some of the st- statistics of their results, right? right? So we talked about um, you just talked about this uh, efficiency thing, right? Are we able to operate over a long period of time without efficiency loss? Once they made that tweak to the cation exchange membrane, they were able to operate for over 200 hours straight without any efficiency loss. So that it showed 100% efficiency the whole time. Um, suitable for long-term operation. They're saying that this is scalable for you to do at an industrial level. Um, they aren't concerned about the volume that's being processed or the amount of time that it's being processed. That's a really, really encouraging signal for something that you want to be able to scale to become an industrial process, right? You don't want it to fade off after just a couple of weeks of operation. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is the carbon efficiency. So we talked about the current state of the art is 20% or less carbon efficiency. This process has over 90% carbon efficiency, meaning 90% of the CO2 is being turned into useful fuel at the end of the day. Right. It's not perfect, but that's a really strong signal there that they're they're working on something that has gone from 20 to 90% carbon efficiency. I'm sure they can continue to tweak it to get it closer to 95 or 100 percent efficiency over time yeah yeah and i i think it's worth talking about the actual fuel that we get out of it as well right so you can get either potassium or sodium formate um we were looking at the actual molecule composition of sodium formate essentially it's a hydrogen molecule bonded by um carbon and oxygen yeah and that's what's giving it the extra stability in comparison to just storing hydrogen in terms of things that make sense for us and our daily lives, I think the best example is something like a hydrogen fuel cell car. It seems very promising. It's very energy dense. But the problems that we've seen in the real world is that the transportation and storage of that hydrogen, that liquid hydrogen, is making it very difficult to scale this up rapidly, right? Um, and as you store it in these tanks, the hydrogen starts to leak apparently at a rate of 1% per day. What you're seeing with this sodium formate is that it's not as energy dense. However, it's solid. So that means you can actually um, have more of it within the fuel cell than you would of the liquid. And it is incredibly stable. It can stay in a normal steel tank for, I think you mentioned already, but like years, decades. And we have a lot of experience handling it, transporting it, storing it. So there's that added level of safety as well. Yeah, I mean, and the shelf life is something that's really encouraging versus hydrogen, right? Mm-hmm. This 1% loss every day versus being pretty much 100% over weeks and years and months, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I do want to highlight what you said around energy density, right? It, basically, um, it's a more stable packaged version of hydrogen. Hydrogen, the hydrogen bond there is still the one that we're being used, still exploiting to either store or then later release energy um it's it's not great the energy density here because you've got basically dead weight of co2 um versus just hydrogen molecules but um i think we get a lot of convenience out of the dry powder we get a lot of convenience out of the fact that it's a stable fuel and it doesn't need extreme temperature or pressure to be able to maintain it um so one of the things i think about separately from cars is like powering homes Mm -hmm. um in my home it doesn't really matter to me how much a tank of fuel weighs um it's not actively impacting the efficiency of my home the way that it does in a car you know payload in a car uh costs a lot in terms of energy efficiency in terms of fuel consumption um payload in the house basically doesn't exist i I don't care if you put a hundred thousand pound brick in the corner as long as it doesn't take up too much space so um i see a potential future here using formate as a fuel source for things like backup generators um or maybe even local generators replacing the grid um uh as a storage method for electricity that's being generated from renewable energy sources the the way that i think about it is like if i had a um wind turbine at my factory um and the wind's not always blowing but when it is i want to be able to store that electricity instead of storing that electricity in a battery or something that 
degrades over time or needs to be replaced, you could use formate as yep. an energy storage method. Um, and as the turbine's generating electricity, you're able to power this formate reaction, generate formate, and then you've got this stable inert dry powder. Um, and when you want to use the electricity, you want to consume it, you just mix this with water inside a formate fuel cell, and then that generates electricity. So think about a factory with a bunch of wind turbines. You're not actively using the wind turbines to keep the lights on. You need some sort of energy storage method. You could use formate as the replacement for lithium ion batteries or whatever it is that people are using for energy storage. Um, and in, in this case, it becomes pretty much a carbon neutral exchange. Um, you're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to store the energy. And then when you're done consuming the energy, you release the carbon dioxide back. It's not the greatest solution. It's not completely sequestering carbon. But what it is doing is it's just borrowing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then putting it back. It's not contributing to additional, additional carbon, dioxide, right. carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And like this, this entire process, there's two bits where you're going to need energy input, right? You need it for converting the, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the liquid metal bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. And that's when the article mentioned you can use low carbon fuel sources like energy sources like solar, nuclear, or wind. That's what you were talking about. The next stage is drying that out. And they mentioned you could just, you know, utilize the sun, just kind of leave out the material to use it as the precursor for the potassium or the sodium. Um, I'm blanking. Sodium. Formate. Formate. There it is. Um, and both, like you said, if you're not in a rush for like how you want to handle your energy sources at a plant or at your home or whatever, they seem pretty doable. Like you have passive solar coming in. Battery probably doesn't make sense, at least not yet, because of how much it costs and the capacity and the degradation and the recycling of it, the net environmental impact, yada, yada, yada. This could be a potential like in-between approach that's feasible to store, burn, and just put the same carbon back into the atmosphere. Yeah. And like, like I said, this isn't turning CO2 from the villain into the hero, but it turns CO2 from the villain to this complex character um, that is a healthy, happy medium that is useful to us and is not further damaging the atmosphere and the environment as it has been to date. Um, I, I think it's pretty compelling. And like you said, out of most of the recent episodes, discussions we've been having around how do we make CO2 useful to us, this seems like one of the most promising out of any of the ones we've spoken to to date. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about hydrogen's future. And I see this as a good um, first step of making it wide, widely available to get hydrogen fuel cells kind of going. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. So before we wrap up, I want to do a quick recap. Yes. Um, I'll try and run us through what we covered today. Um, so here goes. Shoot. Imagine you can take carbon dioxide, this yucky gas that's in the air, been causing trouble for our planet for hundreds of years, and turn it into a special clean powder that can sit on a shelf for years. Later, whenever you need it, you can mix it with water and it creates energy to power homes or whole buildings. Um, and it doesn't make the air any more dirty than it was before. It's, it's net carbon neutral. So this team from MIT and Harvard, these engineers have worked together, figured out a smart way to make this happen using some clean electricity and some clever science tricks. Um, and essentially here, the, the fuel that we're talking about is we're able to turn CO2 into formate fuel. And that's what's being able to be used to generate electricity to power our homes, et cetera. Money. You got it. Thanks, dude. <laughs> I'm always here for support. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's the episode. Yeah, let's let's wrap it up here, man. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>